let's see if I can see myself here. Maybe I can't. Well, it's probably for the best. <laughs> okay, well, hello, everyone, and uh, greetings from sunny Queensland uh, in Australia. Uh, it's currently 10 o'clock at night here, so not actually sunny after all. I, uh, I told a lie there, but uh, certainly um, it will be much sunnier than what you will be accustomed to there in Lancaster. Um, I know Lancaster fairly well in that I was actually born in Blackpool. All my extended family still live there, for better or worse. Um, so I know how the weather is and how much I probably never want to go back there <laughs> anytime soon. Um, but I also remember giving a talk a long time ago uh, for the uh, when I was a graduate student at Cambridge. I came up for the the Lancaster graduate student seminars or like conference series, and I and I came and I gave a talk on. Um, I was doing second language reference tracking and using a corpus to kind of look at that. And I remember that my grandmother and cousin had come down from Blackpool to kind of listen in to the talk, see what it was all about. And they, they left and said, yes, they were very impressed. They didn't actually have a clue what I was talking about. So I'm sure that we can all relate to that, getting family members in on, the, on, a, on kind of applied linguistics talks. So, um, I'm working now at the University of Queensland. I was previously uh, working at the University of Hong Kong uh, under Professor Ken Hyland there. And I've been at the University of Queensland now since 2017, so three years uh, here in Australia. And much of that time has been spent working on corpus linguistics related um, studies and applications. Uh, but my main area of research over the last kind of four or five years has been on the direct use of corpora for language teaching. So I come from a language teaching background. I, I spent uh, seven years in South Korea as an English language um, teacher there. I, I worked at, at all levels of education um, from uh, all the way down to kindergarten, up to middle school, high school, universities, um, private companies, you name it, uh, I've probably taught there. And so I'd, coming from a teaching background and then getting into applied linguistics and corpus linguistics while I was at Cambridge, um, set me kind of in good stead for, for working on English for academic and specific purposes at Hong Kong and um, for trying to do my best to to bring um, corpus corpus based teaching um, approaches what we commonly now think of as data driven learning into um, university education I had a lot of success doing it at the University of Hong Kong uh, I've also had a lot of uh, success doing this at the University of Queensland as well at the tertiary level. But over the last couple of years in particular, I've been trying very hard to work with pre-tertiary learners um, at the secondary as well as primary levels of education to try and introduce um, corpus-based pedagogies, data-driven learning into teacher training uh, setups in the, at the kind of initial stage with a view to eventually trialing uh, data-driven learning in classroom settings with, um, with pre-tertiary learners. And that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at at the moment research-wise. Today's talk, I'm going to just discuss the work that I've been doing this year which has been very, very interesting, but also very, very difficult given the COVID-19 situation and the fact that travel to and from Indonesia, which was planned um, to carry out this research was very quickly um, canceled and everything had to be moved online in order to get this kind of research project off the ground. But it's been a, a, a really interesting learning experience, and I hope that um, what I'm going to talk about today will be of interest for everybody listening in here. 
So uh, let's get started here discussing the, the what data driven learning is. I mean, I'm probably I'm talking to uh, a collective of corpus linguists, um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But for those of you who are interested in data driven learning, data driven learning is learners directly in a hands on way engaging with language corpus data for variety of purposes, whether that's for acquiring um, disciplinary literacies, perhaps at university level, second language acquisition, uh, early years literacy, lots of different applications for this approach. This can be seen in the form of printed concordance materials. Uh, which is usually seen as a good first step into data driven learning for uh, learners who may not be accustomed to or may not have the technical uh, ability to go in and consult corporate directly given current tools. But increasingly, uh, DDL really refers to uh, learners hands on use of corpora, corpus tools in order to learn about the statistical and contextual information about language in use as represented in so-called authentic terms by corpora or principled collections of electronically searchable text. And uh, I always use the, the quote from Tim Johns uh, in every DDL paper or, or study that I work on in that the role of the learner under a DDL approach is that of every student as Sherlock Holmes. In terms of the theory underlying DDL, and there's been a lot of talk recently about more closely aligning language learning theory, such as usage based approaches to uh, the work that is being done on data driven learning, uh, the teaching and language corpora conference for this year. Some of the most interesting talks and plenaries by Pascal Perez Paradez and Anne O'Keefe focused on uh, particularly on usage based approaches uh, of the, the language, uh, second language learning theory and how these relate to DDL. Um, in terms of. The kind of learning that takes place. Theorists have claimed that DDL promotes a kind of constructivist approach to learning in that learners are learning best when they discover or could be led to discover by themselves. There's lots of talk about autonomous learning, learner centered approaches, focus on form. Um, recently, though, Anne O'Keefe uh, from Limerick has also said that aside from the learner doing the work, when DDL is implemented in classroom settings, this lends itself very well to socio-cultural theories of, of second language acquisition in that you've got collaborative uh, teacher or peer mediated discussion around the corpora and the corpus data and the kind of queries that learners are engaging with and they're sharing this information with each other. So. You've got kind of the best of both worlds. You, you, you're getting learners to, to work things out by themselves in a kind of inductive way. And then in classroom settings, you're getting people talking about language data and, and talking about the, the patterns and trends in the data and what they are learning and what they notice from a social cultural perspective. So a very rich source of multiple kind of ways in to second language acquisition uh, if that's your ultimate goal and that's the goal that we're going to be talking about today. However, and um, this is kind of true for a lot of research on second language learning that's done say at university level, but it's particularly true for studies and data driven learning is that we just really don't yet have that much data on studies of DDL that have been conducted at the university. Just to do studies in university, um, you don't have nearly the same kind of problems getting access or ethical approval. Teachers are incredibly busy. It's, it's just 
it's so much it's so very difficult to get in and, and work with people and persuade teachers that this might be a good thing to try and there's been a number of meta-analyses of uh, data-driven learning studies recently. We've got the Bolton and Cobb study 2017, which is very well cited. Uh, Perez Paradez put one out last year as well. Lee, Shout Lee Warshower and Lee uh, put one out in 2018. I think it was published 2019, which has looked at vocabulary. And across these three meta-analyses, there's still a huge lack of empirical data for DDL and studies done on pre-tertiary learners. Uh, about over 5% of studies, just over, have been conducted in high school settings. And for a number of reasons, and I'm looking at kind of uh, uh, some of the reasons for this myself in a, in a paper that I'm writing at the moment is that the number of data driven learning studies involving primary schools uh, are very, very small. You probably count them on one hand uh, or maybe two hands now. Uh, maybe we've reached, maybe we've gone past the one hand threshold already. Um, but there's just a real lack of data. And this is a real shame. Because I found that in the edited volume that I published uh, last year with some really great contributors, that if you do give pre tertiary learners a chance, they actually get really good at it. And most of the issue behind the lack of DDL studies is not to do with the learners themselves, but it's the adults. The adults, the teachers are the ones who are the barriers to getting DDL kind of tested and, and experimented and implemented in, in pre-tertiary settings. If you give them a chance, they take to it uh, almost like a duck to water. For example, in the study that I did with uh, a colleague from UQ, uh, Anita Stell, last year in my own chapter and in the edited volume, we had two grade five boys, so they would have been about um, 11, 12 years old, so not yet at high school, but obviously they'd kind of reached a, a level of, a basic level of kind of literacy and probably ICT literacy as well. We looked at these within a private home tutoring setting because it was kind of almost impossible to get into primary schools to do the study, but uh, it's much uh, more straightforward if you're trying to do a study within private tutoring settings. And we um, exposed these two children to uh, Sketch Engine for Language Learning, uh, developed by uh, Vit Beiser and colleagues as well as some of the simpler functions of the main sketch engine platform as well. And found that as both of these uh, boys reacted positively towards Corpora as a tool, they, when we discussed the use of the tool with them, they felt that it made acquiring certain vocabulary and checking word meaning um, learning more about multi-word units, uh, it was really useful for doing that. Um, they also went beyond kind of the hints and tips that we gave them and were quite willing and able to come up with their own corpus query syntax, um, sometimes erroneously, but sometimes often in just ways that we couldn't predict or expect. And most importantly, we found that they were frequently accessing the platform um, a long time after the kind of study period of the data collection period um, was scheduled for. So it, this was really good news. And I think that the, the two boys involved in the study are still using the platform today. And they've also managed to rope some of their own mates into using it as well. So I mentioned before that the adults may be the problem here rather than the children. There's nothing specifically problematic necessarily for younger learners to get involved with corpus use and get involved with data-driven learning. Uh, 
But there are a number of barriers, and I've kind of listed three of the main ones here. First of all, is that most available corpora and corpus tools are not necessarily designed with younger learners in mind. Corpora are almost overwhelmingly based on um, well-formed English produced by native speakers of the language and written for adults. So if you look at, say, the British National Corpus for whatever, uh, for example, there's very few uh, text in there that would be suitable for, for younger learners. Um, so one of the steps that need to be taken is that of pedagogic processing where existing adult focus corpus materials are somehow made, uh, somehow simplified for increased readability, understanding, uh, decreased lexical and syntactic complexity, so that the data that they're exposed to is more comprehensible and therefore of more use for language acquisition. So that's a, that's a huge issue. And we don't have that many corpora that are suitable for that, although recently innovations on software like Sketch Engine, for example, call their good, dic good dictionary examples function or GDEX within that is able to simplify concordance output using uh, information on word frequency and uh, and, uh, and other kind of measures to, to make concordances more simplified. The other issue, of course, then is a lack of specific software um, that is suitable for use with younger learners. I mean, the most common tools that are used are Sketch Engine for language learning, which is really very good and very straightforward. Um, but then there's still uh, a huge number of studies done with Sketch Engine which is a great platform, but it's really like using a, a sledgehammer to, to crack a walnut. It, 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 it's far too advanced for specific use with younger learners. Or we get onto um, very commonly used kind of uh, software like for research purposes like EntCon, for example, or uh, the quite complex web interfaces of like BYU, uh, or, or so on. And these are great tools, but they're not great tools for younger learners. And we need more specific tools that deal with their specific needs um, to make corpus use more accessible, uh, more attractive for them. So um, the kind of the race is on to develop something like that. But what we're interested in more today is a general lack of corpus literacy for pre or in service teacher trainers of younger learners. And this is where kind of most of the DDL studies that involve younger learners are at. So there's not many studies within classroom settings, although the edited volume has a, a few of these. Most studies at this point involving pre-tertiary learners are at the teacher training stage. And it's applied linguists like me who are also corpus linguists or corpus fanatics in a way, corpus missionaries to use the words of, of Uteroma, um, going into school settings and, and getting teachers on board for professional development workshops and going, hey, we've got this great new approach. Uh, use the technology, it can help your learners really well, um, can make them into kind of all these kind of autonomous language learning machines. Um, and it'll train them in data management skills as well. And, and we hear back from the from the teacher trainees like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. And then they'll, they'll go and have a few workshops together with somebody like me. And then it's probably they'll go that the feedback will be like, oh, yeah, very interesting. Great, but I can't use it. Uh, and that's probably where most of the sessions have, have kind of ended up like that. I've had a few sessions like that where you go in and you try your best, and that's as far as you get. Corpus literacy as a whole is still very limited among teacher trainees. And uh, as I was working with teacher trainees in Indonesia, who we'll be talking about uh, later, 
I, I stumbled across this kind of notion and I, I also got this from uh, Fanny Mounier who contributed um, the chapter in my edited volume and she's talked about this now in a couple of uh, chapters um, in terms of what's called technological pedagogical content knowledge or TPAC and I, I'd actually gone a very long time in my career as a corpus linguist is kind of not really knowing about this but then so then when I heard about it it's kind of like okay that kind of makes perfect sense and the idea is that many teacher trainees uh, probably have quite good content knowledge uh, they build they know the subject uh, they know what it is they know the curriculum they know what they got to teach and the teacher training usually sets them up with decent pedagogical knowledge um, for pre-service teachers or in-service teachers will have developed that pedagogical knowledge over their years of experience. We then also have technological knowledge and I think the most kind of or even the older teachers around us and the younger teachers these days have quite good technical knowledge in that they know how to, to use and operate a computer. They are comfortable using specific apps for learning that are on the curriculum. Uh, they're good with internet based, internet based technologies. They can they know how Netflix works or whatever, but it's putting these things together to be able to understand how to integrate technology and pedagogy and to use that integration to enhance the knowledge of content where teacher training kind of falls over and there's there is an issue with that as we um, as we can see here there's a great kind of quote that I got from a, a Hutchison article 2012, which kind of summarizes what I've seen when I have kind of touted data driven learning workshops to teacher trainees is that most of the training workshops um, focus on teaching the trainees how to use corpora, how to do data their own and they're usually quite receptive to this and they quite positive about using corporate maybe in their own practice at least that's what they say they're going to do but the issue is and I've heard this so many times now from various workshops that I've done here in Australia or in the UK or uh, in Indonesia is that um, okay so I've got the corpus technology kind of got an idea about how to use it. How can I integrate it into what I'm doing right now? Because I've got a curriculum to follow. I've got to teach maybe a Shakespeare play or a, a novel like To Kill a Mockingbird, for example. And I've got a group of students who speak English as an additional language. They're probably about, say, IELTS 5, IELTS 6. And I need to be able to teach them to kill a mockingbird, which is quite a difficult text even for native speakers because it's kind of written a long time ago. But that's what's on the curriculum. They got to do it. How can I then go ahead and use this wonderful corpus technology to help me to do that. And this is where so far we're kind of stuck because there just hasn't been enough research in this area where people like myself have gone, OK, well, let me see what it is that you're doing and then I'll put we'll put our heads together and see if we can work out a way to integrate what I can do into what you're doing. So this great quote here kind of summarizes that. Um, from from Hutchinson uh, here. Seeing the lesson plans and seeing the curricula that the teachers are working with is absolutely essential if we are going to get corpora and data driven learning into mainstream practice. So that's what we were trying to do. Not only that, um, 
Most of the DDL studies that have been done, again, if you look at the Bolton and Cobb meta-analysis, you'll see that the vast majority of studies have been done on so-called weird contexts. These are white, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic contexts. And actually, the interesting thing from the Bolton and Cobb meta-analysis is most of their studies were done in Asia. But by Asia, the vast majority of these studies is Hong Kong, Singapore, China, South Korea, Japan, which all were well white, certainly not white countries, are definitely educated, industrialized, rich, perhaps not democratic in all of them, but they they tick a lot of boxes. So this for me is reflective of the so-called digital divide between students in those countries, teachers in those countries, and their neighbors for whom uh, access to even basic kind of internet technologies may cannot be taken for granted. So we don't actually know very much at all about what teacher trainees are doing outside of those contexts. And this is a gap that I was trying to fill with my study. So for Indonesian teachers in particular, there was a study done in 2011 that you can see here some of the statistics about the access to and the training in uh, basic kind of call or ICT issues here. So if things are this bad, generally you can be pretty damn sure that the, uh, the notion of a corpus or data-driven learning is almost, what's that? Never heard of it. So uh, there's a lot of work to do. This project though, I was working, made contact for a PhD student of mine with a teacher training facility in Jakarta, Indonesia. This is Atmajaya University. And we put together a project to kind of upskill these teacher trainees in digital uh, pedagogies. And one of the digital pedagogies that was selected was that of corpus use data driven learning. We're trying to get that into their their lesson planning activities within their teacher training course. Um, in order to see whether they can handle this and what some of the unique kind of interesting things going on in the Indonesian context that may or may not allow DDL to be integrated easily or not. So obviously, given COVID-19, everything had to be done online because I wasn't allowed to enter the country. Well, I could have entered the country, but I wouldn't have been allowed back home. So that would have been very bad. But luckily, um, we have uh, an online course which trains mainly research postgraduate students, but a lot of other people have taken this course. Um, it trains people in the use of Scale and uh, Sketch Engine. And this is uh, a course that I developed in previous research. Uh, it's hosted here on edX. It's called Improving Writing Through Corpora. And this is a five module course that takes um, participants through basic corpus functions such as understanding concordances, uh, conducting searches with part of speech, um, understanding frequency information, understanding collocation, some of the, the more advanced functions like word sketch or uh, word sketch difference for understanding disciplinary register variation and some kind of useful strategies or uh, ready-made um, corpus queries that could help resolve lexical and grammatical errors. So we were able to get these teacher trainees to do module one, which is kind of an introduction to what how, what corpora are and how they're different from kind of translation websites or uh, some of the resources that your students would be typically using already. And then module two, which gives them just by training in the, uh, the very basics of understanding corpus output and generating corpus queries. Then 
uh, students were asked to discuss about the training that they were receiving uh, via Google Classroom together with their Indonesian teacher trainer. You can see here a screenshot of some of the comments that were related to uh, what they were doing with Corpora. And this was another way that the students could work together to uh, discuss matters related to the training. I also conducted a series of uh, Zoom workshops uh, that lasted kind of three hours long. There were three of these where I ran through the basics of Corpus consultation in workshop one. Workshop two uh, discussed building and analyzing your own corpus. So it was a little introduction to tools like uh, Versatext or Voyant tools, uh, which some of you uh, may have seen or heard of before, as well as having a, a brief look at Anconc as well. And then workshop three covered some of the basic ideas involved in DDL pedagogy and how that might be incorporated into lesson planning. So the main things I want to talk today is about the lesson plan analysis. How did what did we do and how did that work? So the teachers, uh, teacher trainees, sorry, were already making lesson plans um, for their uh, for their teacher training course. And what they did was they sent those lesson plans in to me to analyze them for areas where a corpus activity could reasonably be included or where it might uh, enhance the activity that was stated. So for example here, uh, the secondary school trainees, all of their lesson plans involve their learners learning about a particular genre. And this is in line with the kind of second language or English education curriculum in Indonesian curriculum. So you would see objectives such as students should be able to understand the generic structure of genre X um, through discussion with teacher and peers. They would be asked to write their own exemplar of that genre for discussion with the group or for for written corrective feedback from their teacher. And then what I would do is I would go into these lesson plans and add in comments about how a corpus or data driven learning could be used to enhance some of these objectives. And you can see here in the slide some of the ideas that I would presented there. Often objectives were quite grammar focused as well. This is one taken from the primary school trainees where learners are being asked to identify the use of simple past tense and differences between regular verbs and irregular verbs. So I mentioned here that a corpus activity where learners are using part of speech search, for example, uh, may enhance the teaching uh, uh, or the pedagogy involved in the learners reaching this objective, or they would kind of post lists of vocabulary that learners had to memorize for the most part. And I would suggest here that a corpus could be used by students to explore this vocabulary in context, to look at some of the other statistical or collocational information attached to these particular vocabulary, either in a general corpus or in a DIY corpus. So just trying to use a corpus here to really enhance some of these quite dry um, objectives or lists of vocabulary. In some of the other tutors lesson plans, they just kind of get these um, almost like uh, Grambo reference guide um, descriptions about doing something like simple past. And this would be how they would try to teach their young learners. And you would see sometimes that the trainees would very carefully script what they were going to say in the class to their students, almost like a movie script or something like that. And the teacher would be reading this out to the student or drawing it on the board and 
in this kind of a really basic uh, like grammar translation type approach to language teaching. So I would mention that something like this could be turned into a series of, of corpus activities to raise awareness about what's going on here uh, and really kind of make things a little bit more lively. So again, here on this next slide is an example of that scripting. Um, I mean, God help them if the if the students didn't want to say the thing that was in the in the script or the students were being a bit naughty that day, which is, is very common, happens all the time. But again, here the teacher would say something like, what does a word mean? And I would jump in here and leave a note to say, well, why don't you ask them to query the corpus to find them, find it out without you having to explain it? And you see, they would do this a lot. Like here, how about signature? What does signature mean? I don't know. And the teacher says, it's a dish that identifies an individual chef or the restaurant. And it's like, well, OK, I'm sure they understood that. Um, but maybe they could have gone into a corpus to learn a bit more about it for themselves. Um, they also had at least one set reading that they would get from an Internet source. So one of the things that I, I a tool that I've really fallen in love with recently is James Thomas's Versatext, uh, where it just provides you a very quick and easy way of inputting some of these source texts and getting some linguistic information out. So I'm just showing you here an example from the one of the pre-built examples within Versa text, which can show you a word cloud, which is selectable for things like uh, the part of speech, concordances, for example, here buildings, I can bring up concordances of the words in the word cloud taken from that text. So students can see that word in context. We also have the profiler here, which explains about which words are in the top 1000 frequency list and listed here by part of speech. So these would be the areas the the, the vocabulary that learners might be expected to learn first. Uh, less frequent vocabulary and academic word vocabulary probably seen as more difficult. And then the text specific words here, um, which again is useful just to have these available to teachers um, to understand how this text, uh, some of the key vocabulary that would be in this text that students might be expected to need to know. So all very useful uh, stuff. It's a great tool and I would kind of post the output here and mention that they could make activities from uh, this kind of output. So this process happened just prior to the first kind of video workshop and then the Indonesian tutor set an assessment task for these trainees that said that they would have to as an assessment item, design a new lesson plan, and that new lesson plan had to have at least one corpus activity embedded within it. So they all managed to do this, except for the primary school teachers. It was kind of about halfway through the study, we lost them. We lost the primary school teachers. They didn't feel that this approach was for them even though I provided a lot of advice on their lesson plans, which kind of showed them maybe how it could work. But we got real resistance from the primary school teachers, and I'm just writing a paper now um, that is going to explore that in more detail. So for now, I'm just going to be talking about the secondary school teachers here. And we received lesson plans from all of the individual secondary school teachers. So this is like nine, nine people. And we analyzed these lesson plans for TPAC or that again, that that technical pedagogical content knowledge using uh, a rubric that was taken from previous research. And these were we, we then ranked these lesson plans into low, medium and high TPAC. So I'm just going to spend the rest of the talk just explaining how this works and to give you some examples here. We start off with the low TPAC lesson plan. And here the uh, of the teacher in the objective. Um, the lesson plan objective is to get students to talk about descriptive texts. Uh, based on a, a set reading that they got from the Internet, something about a Lake Toba 
which I presume is in in Indonesia. It's a tourist attraction there. And basically the objective mentions corpora here in objective um, five to make a simple outline of descriptive text using scale and versa text. But unfortunately, they don't really uh, provide any clarity about how learners are to find uh, some of these, um, what, what kind of vocabulary it is and structures that they have to be looking for. They mention keywords as an objective, but again, it's not really clear about how they're supposed to find them or how this how consulting the corpus will help them to answer comprehension questions about the reading passage. So again, learners here are directed to use Versatext to see if some of these are primarily dealing with adjectives, um, whether the adjectives from the corpus match those of the reading text, but it was really unclear why they would need to use the same adjectives in their own text when they were writing. You can see here that, again, there are very limited uh, mentions of corpus use or DDL throughout the whole lesson plan. Here in the main activity section, uh, you can see here a kind of sequencing about what it is that the learners are supposed to do. But corpora are mentioned here in step five. Uh, the teacher will introduce a corpus to find the meaning that is related to tourist attraction using scale. But no guidance is provided about how the teacher will do this or how the corpus um, may be used to achieve this objective. Then we've got here the students will try by themselves to operate the corpus. And then we've got the teacher shows the students about using a corpus, but this is not a corpus, this is the, the, versa, the versa text uh, link. So presumably it's just the corpus of the reading passage to find the keywords of the text or like the most words that appear in the text. And then students use the keywords to lead the students to find the answer to the comprehensive question. So essentially there's, there, there's kind of lip service to a corpus here, but if you gave this lesson plan to somebody else, they, or, or they would probably have no idea about what it is that they're supposed to use the corpus to do, or what it is, the, what it is that they're supposed to search for, and how what it is they're supposed to search for can then help them with the next stages of the task. So in terms of TPAC, um, the integration of the technology and the pedagogy to help with the content knowledge is really vague and the lack of instructional strategies and scaffolding actually will probably in a real classroom setting prevent the learners from meeting the the stated objectives so this is why this kind of lesson plan was ranked as low tpac we then have here a medium tpac lesson plan where We've got some explicit mention of corpus and what it is that we're going to be using them for. So we'll be analyzing text structures and language focus through corpus tools, which is a little bit of a kind of clearer connection between some uh, classroom activity and uh, a use of corpora for achieving that activity. here. If we actually look at the sequencing and scaffolding of, of what the, the learners would be asked to do, we see here that there would be some teacher led discussion of target language features conducted prior to DDL. So kind of setting up the learners for looking at kind of what language and what grammar it is that we're going to be querying the corpus for. And then with the corpus use spans multiple stages of both input and output focused activities. So here at stage 20, for example, students are asked to highlight present tense and action verbs in the report test example, and then use scale to look for context that use these verbs. So that's a really kind of nicely scaffolded way, nicely sequenced way from going from the source text to then getting into the corpus and learning more about the words and structures that it is that they're supposed to be dealing with.
Also, uh, stage 25, for example, teacher asked the students to produce a report text paragraph individually and then use the scale corpus to check the grammar. Um, there's a bit of lack of clarity there, but overall you can see that the corpus used corpus use spans input and output focused activities. There's opportunity for teacher scaffolding. Um, the sequencing is really nice. So uh, there's a fairly decent integration of technology, pedagogy and content knowledge going on here. For the high T pet lesson plan, and we had quite a few of these, which was really encouraging. Um, we've got here the lesson plan objectives and competences uh, very clearly specify how corpora will be used to help meet those objectives. And in particular here, we've got within the lesson plan a kind of warm up discussion, an extended reading passage, a teacher led demonstration of the BAWE corpus within Sketch Engine. And then following student, a little bit of time devoted for student analysis of the corpus, the learners are then get to uh, an external corpus game that is hosted on like one of these interactive quiz websites. And learners will be asked questions about some of their analyses uh, of what they done uh, when consulting the corpus in the activities. So students would get points for this. There would be a winner who would presumably get some kind of prize. This would then lead to a teacher student discussion before learners write their own text and present these to their class. So this kind of lesson plan demonstrates a language focused teacher scaffolded set of corpus activities, and there was seamless integration of the DDL technology instructional strategies to achieve the stated lesson objectives. So I'm just about running out of time here, very mindful of this, so I'll just very show you here some of the uh, kind of post training questionnaire data that found that overall the, the learners found the corpora easy to use. They were general uh, confident in their general abilities, but they still had some issues um, analyzing corpus data and they had clear preferences for different kind of corpus software. Related to Indonesian specific concerns, though, uh, most of the trainees still felt that the implementation of DDL is potentially problematic uh, in the Asian, Indonesian context. And a lot of this is related to lack of technology, a rural versus urban divide in access to resources and internet and broadband and so on. Uh, rules related to uh, mobile use or computers in the classroom. Uh, but a lot of these kind of fears, are, some of them are related to Indonesian context, but some of these we've seen many, many times before. And again, it's just example of adult teacher trainees not really getting it and not being willing or, or enough to give their students a chance to try it because they feel that if they don't get it, then my students can't possibly get it. But I've seen time and time again that it's usually the other way around. So again, this just summarizes some of the barriers to corpus use here in the Indonesian context um, that have come out of the questionnaire and the interview data uh, taken post training. So in conclusion, uh, while the teacher trainees generally saw the benefits of corpora and they responded very well to training uh, in terms of the TPAC level of the lesson plans overall, we, we received more lesson plans with high TPAC than we did with low TPAC, which is really encouraging given that all the training was conducted online. None of the trainees had used the corpus previously and we're really proud of kind of being able to get in and 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 providing comments on the lesson plans are just absolutely crucial in getting them on board and making them realize how they can meaningfully implement DDL corpora into their current um, practice. So while there's still a little bit of skepticism, we feel that we really did make real progress. 
But most of the negative comments, as mentioned, came from the primary school trainees. Those in the secondary school group were really largely positive. They went through and they did the lesson planning activity. Um, they really got a lot out of it, but we've still got a ton of resistance from the primary school trainees, and this is a big nut to crack if we're ever going to get DDL corpora seen in mainstream education. So a lot of work to do here. This is work that I'm rapidly trying to finish off this year, putting in multiple grant applications to develop a new younger learner specific tool together with VitBiser, the uh, developer of uh, Scale and VersaText. And hopefully if one of these uh, grant applications pays out, then we'll come up with a brand new tool and we'll be sharing that with the international research and teaching community uh, when we've finished our study. So do watch this space. OK, I think I'm pretty much just about on time here. So thanks for watching and listening to my talk today. Um, it's, it's kind of really disconcerting not being able to see anybody. So I've really just, I, and I haven't been hearing anything either. So I, for all I know, the internet connection died and I've just been talking to myself for the last half an hour. But um, anyway, if you are still there, um, sign up for the course. I'll um, sign, uh, I'll give the, the link to any of the videos, any of the uh, YouTube links, uh, the course link upon email request. Um, and, and thanks again for listening. So uh, now, uh, if you are all still there, I will have a bit of time for questions. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now so that I can see the rest of you. OK, do we have any question for Peter? OK, so you are there. You are all there. You haven't disappeared. <laughs> they are still there. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, no. when you do the share screen on Teams, you can't see yourself mm -hmm. and you can't see anybody else. So that's yeah, it's like, where did they go? But anyway, uh, let's get the questions in while we've still got time. OK, any question? Well, let me check uh, chat box, maybe some. All right, yep, no problem. go in the chat you box can, as well. Yeah, you can unmute yourself. Hello, Peter. Hello, Noah. Well, last time I saw you, I think it's like two years ago. <laughs> two years ago, where was time. I? Where, where, was I drunk? In the interview, <laughs> interview for the application. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey. Yeah. Oh, so, right. Yeah. Yes, so, how did um, that go? Yes, I'm very good in Lancaster and I'm still doing the research about the DDL. Fantastic. But it's different from like direct using of DDL. I'm mm -hmm. uh, doing my research on the indirect DDL and how students can use it, the process of students using it and how students' uh, perceptions on it. Um, thank you for your um, presentation. Yes, I think there are lots of things that I will agree with. Um, this summer I did my pilot study and I also have like a lots of like times like chatting with the English teachers, but well, not in the high school or primary school, just in the university like level. Um, I just feel like, yes, we have seen lots of like DDL tools under the development and a lot of like research showing, um, well, it works. There are lots of very positive outcomes for the DDL tools. But at, yeah. uh, on the other hand, uh, yes, I asked uh, the teachers, well, say, well, there are lots of papers showing like our oh, students can benefit a lot from those DDL tools, do you think it's possible to uh, to get them like involved in your teaching? They said, well, the result is, is very, very impressive, but the answer is no. Uh, yeah. yeah, there are lots of like mentioned reasons in your presentation. That's the same reasons they, they reported. And also yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about like, if there's any possibility that um, teachers Actually, they don't know what kind of like link between the DDL and their previous knowledge about the second language acquisition when they, uh, as a teacher or as a student learning the applied linguistics. And some of them reported 
they use the corpora to some extent in their classroom, but it's most of the time unconsciously. They don't think that's anything relevant to DDL or yeah. like the use of language corpora in the EFL teaching. And yeah. then I'm thinking about uh, Pascal's uh, a review. Uh, she mentioned that it's kind of like most of the time the DDL research is about... Uh, sorry, um, we have only like four minutes, so maybe give time for Peter to answer your question and maybe... Oh, yes, so just, yeah, it's just email. not a question, it's just a comment, yes. Yes, <laughs> thanks, Noah. So, but I mean, obviously we can discuss this in uh, more detail later if we're going to be working on this uh, idea of getting the course translated into Mandarin. So yes. um, I'll use the remaining time to, to take on some other questions. I think there was one question typed in by uh, Ye Jin Jung, which yeah. I'm just going to respond to right now. So yeah, obviously for younger learners, especially those at primary level, learners developing their first lit language literacy from picture books onto chapter books and then onto whole text. So main, one of the primary considerations is that multimodal corpora are absolutely essential um, for data-driven learning with really young learners. So we have multimodal corpora available and there's been a couple of studies uh, done by uh, some researchers like Eri Hirata in Japan uh, and a couple of others. Uh, I was in a, a talk a couple of weeks ago with the Japanese kind of corpus um, society over there um, talking about this. And they so there are a couple of multimodal corpus tools developed that use that kind of that have the pictures and the text together, but it's it's still really small scale and it's not publicly available yet. So we're still some way behind on getting a kind of concordance or a corpus data together that would be suitable. So this is what I'm looking ahead in 2021 if I can get this funding to build this new tool that can maybe use uh, simplified concordances and a gamification aspect as well so that the learners feel encouraged to keep uh, using the platform so that they level up and they get experience points and they can get like avatars and stickers and they it, it can it can be really uh, much better integrated into what students are trying to do so the answer is, I get the short answer is, we are working on it. Give us time. We'll have something ready that you can all use very soon, I'm sure. All let's right, take another, let's take another question. Um, I think we have only one minute, so maybe. Let's have a quick one. Let's see. Do we have more question? One quick question. No. I think so, somebody was typing something, but maybe they. Uh, they I think it's good. Thank enough. you. <laughs> no, there was somebody else as well, but uh, that's okay. Right. But anyway, if you have any more specific questions, then uh, feel free to send me an email, or if you want to set up a Zoom chat. Bear in mind the time difference, because it's now like eleven o'clock at night my time. But yeah, uh, I see Paul uh, Rayson is typing something. Maybe he's gonna. Oh, no, it's just a thanks for the tool. Perfect. Okay, well then, if there's, uh, and Paul, thanks for your tools. Um, keep making them. Maybe maybe you could put something together um, that might help us out as well. So thanks for your tool. I use your tools in my, my dentistry book. You, you probably saw the citation. I use the, uh, the semantic, um, semantic tagger, USAS. Fantastic stuff. Really very good. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah. No, no, obviously Thanks. I listen to these to try and get ideas to how to improve the tools in the future. Yeah, I mean, this this is an ongoing process. I mean, it's amazing in 2020 that people are still, I mean, Ankonk's a great tool. I love Lawrence Anthony. He's a, he's a great guy, but it's amazing that Ankonk is still like the de facto, the standard DDL tool in so many of these studies that are coming out. And it's like, I wouldn't dream of using that with younger with younger learners. Uh, so we really need new tools spe uh, specifically for this purpose. OK, thank you very much, Peter.
maybe there are more questions, but we are scheduled only for one hour and I do not That's want to right. prolong the session yeah. longer because time difference, it's already 11, I think, right now where Peter is. So if you yep. still have more questions or want to discuss something, maybe you can email him. And this ends our session. I will stop recording.